Hey guys, welcome back to another episode ranking all of the episodes of Doctor Who. Today we are on series 12, continuing off from yesterday, uh, where we talked a little bit about series 11. Now, here's my spoiler warning for this episode, specifically my thoughts on this season. I personally like series 12 a lot more than series 11. I think it has much higher highs, I think it has much lower lows. And for whatever reason, to me, that makes my personal average ranking higher uh, for series 12 than series 11. That's not usually the case for most fans. It seems like most fans really do like kind of the safety that series 11 has with it. 12 is obviously a lot more experimental. Uh, tends to be the case with the the second series of any Doctor, specifically in New Who, um, where they're trying something new. Obviously, what they tried new uh, toward the latter half of this series is not very well received, um, and we'll talk about that. But today we are ranking all 10 episodes of Doctor Who Series 12 that aired in 2020. We are also including the 2021 New Year special, uh, Revolution of the Daleks, because it fits so well uh, with the grander narrative well, it doesn't fit. Does it fit that well? We'll talk about it. Um, but it it makes a lot more sense to group it with series twelve than series thirteen. So ten episodes from series twelve uh, and the New Year special results in eleven episodes at the bottom of our list today. In F tier, in my opinion, the worst Doctor Who episode. I want to say ever made, but definitely just New Who. Um, Orphan fifty five. I know people who will defend this episode. I'm one of the people who does genuinely think this might be one of the worst episodes in Doctor Who history. Um, the resort looks very good. It was filmed at the same place that they, um, or at least, is it the same place? It's the same architect uh, who did all of the buildings from uh, Series 10's Smile. Um, I think they're filmed at the same spot in Spain. I could be wrong about that. This episode is a mess. Uh, the script is very bad. The dialogue is horrific, the editing is horrific, the makeup is not good, uh, the pacing is not good, the characters are unlikable, all of the companions really have nothing to do. I could end it there and just leave it in F tier and have you guys complain about my decision to put it in F tier in the bottom, but I think for the most part, I'd say about 60% of Doctor Who fans consider this a very bad episode, one of the weaker ones in series 12, if not the worst. I think it's the worst of all time since at least 2005 it starts um they're transported to a resort and graham makes a quick joke about him wearing speedos which feels a little unnecessary the episode starts is that is this the episode that starts with them cleaning up the mess in the tardis from the mating season i think it is i'd have to really think about i I'm, i try hard to remember the openings of some of these episodes um then they're transported to a spa and they're met by a literal cat lady um, whose name is Hyphen and they're at a spa and Yaz cock blocks a guy trying to propose to his elderly girlfriend and he's later killed and Ryan meets a girl with mommy issues and then he gets infected by a virus from a vending machine and then he pretends like he sees bats and the doctor discovers a weapons closet, and then they're under attack. Graham doesn't really do anything in this episode. They're under attack. Um, they're helped out by some green-haired fellas, and the main military chick on the base is revealed to be the mother of Ryan's romantic interest, Mommy Issues character, and so there's the conflict there. Uh, they're attacked by people from outside the spa, on this planet, it's revealed to be a future version of Earth in the far future that's been desolated. A very heavy-handed message about global warming and nuclear warfare. Script bad. Dialogue bad. There's a moment where certain things are unclear with the pacing of the episode and some of the actions in the episode, so they had to go back um, and redub some lines, and the lines are not edited into the scenes very well. There's a couple from Jodie Whittaker, I want to say one from Ryan. Um, that they had to go back and add dialogue in post where they didn't even reshoot it. They just added dialogue to the scene to make it clear what's happening. Um, the ending is very rushed. The, the ending is very bad. All the side characters are very unlikable. This is an even worse version of the Syringa Conundrum, and we talked about Syringa Conundrum yesterday and my thoughts on it. Orphan 55 is very bad. Ending it there. 
Uh, let's move on to, do I have any others in garbage here? Yes, I do. You already know what it is. Uh, it's the finale, two-part finale. It's a three-part finale. One of the three parts is very, very good. Let's talk about the two that aren't. Ascension of the Cybermen and the Timeless Children. I believe... Let me double check here. That's Spyfall. That, I believe, is also Spyfall. So let's... Yeah. So I don't know which I would consider better off the top of my head. I want to say Ascension of the Cybermen is a little better. The Cybermen are threatening in this episode. They really are. It's, except for... I, I don't like the little CGI Cybermen heads flying through and causing havoc. Um, this episode is almost a little racist to Ryan. Both of them are. Um, there's the... the the thing about him and basketball. It is foreshadowed earlier in the season. So it's not like egregiously out of nowhere, make the black guy play basketball kind of a thing. But they don't treat it very well. Um, Ascension of the Cybermen is better, in my opinion. Um, there's a cool emotional moment. It's not necessarily earned, but it's very well acted between Graham and Yaz. The performances of Graham and Yaz are very good, um, but the dialogue and the setup to the scene, in my opinion, isn't earned. Um, it follows along from a very, very weird ending to The Haunting of Villa Diodati, where the Doctor acts fairly out of character and basically sets up the ending of this episode. Ascension of the Cybermen has the problem of being a very forgettable episode. Everyone remembers the finale because of what it does to the lore of the show. Um, but Ascension of the Cybermen does have going for it the Brendan scenes. I think the Brendan scenes are very good. Um, I wish it actually was a story beat rather than just kind of this flashback metaphor um, because I think the, the storytelling with Brendan is very good. Then there's the Timeless Children. Time will show and we'll see. Maybe you guys have already seen it uh, with Russell T. Davies getting his start. Uh, I'm recording this before the 60th anniversary episodes have come out, so I don't know if they've been addressed in the 60th anniversary episodes. Um, I don't know if they'll address it going forward. But, uh, of course, the one of the biggest lore initiatives in Doctor Who history, apart from the Time War, uh, came at the hands of Chris Chibnall talking about the Timeless Child. Um, I'm not going to give my opinions on the Timeless Child arc in this video. I don't love it. That's kind of it. Like, like I, I agree with most people on the Timeless Child arc. I think, it's, I think it's unnecessary. I think it comes out of nowhere. I think it has never been foreshadowed before. I think it... Um, I think Sasha Dewan... His performance in this episode is very bad. I think I think there are certain. I think he actually power of the Doctor. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, I think he's very good in that episode. I don't I don't hate him as the master. I don't love him as the master. I think this is one of his w poorer performances in the Timeless Children. Um, there's a cop out ending where the Doctor doesn't stand her ground and instead makes another person do her dirty work. I like the separation of the companions from the Doctor. Um, the resolution with the Matrix and her being trapped in the Matrix doesn't make any sense um, because it was a... She, she escapes the Matrix by overpowering it by giving her memories of her life that she remembers, which is Doctors 1 through 13. The Matrix is a Time Lord computer, which is meant to house the entire history of the Time Lord people. The Doctor is trapped inside of it, and in order to get out, uses her memory to overpower it. That doesn't make any sense. It's a computer that's supposed to store all of the Time Lord history. People have argued that, no, she overloads it with all of her past lives, um, and it's even more than the Time Lord consciousness can comprehend. And it's like, well, no, because she doesn't remember all of her other lives. Like, she's shown them, but she doesn't remember them. It's It doesn't, like, nothing comes back to her. So it's not, it doesn't make any sense. Um, I really like Ruth, the Ruth Doctor, the Fugitive Doctor. Um, her inclusion in this episode feels a little weird, but we'll talk about that more when we get to Fugitive of the Jadoon. But all of that to say, I think Ascension of the Cybermen is the better of the two. I don't like them at all. Um, I think it ruins a lot of Jodie Whittaker's era. It's very distracting. Um, we saw lore issues with Matt Smith's era. This does it even poorer than the Matt Smith era when it comes to lore and continuity shifts. So let's move up then to D tier. Do I have, what do I have in D tier? 
Uh, let's start with Revolution of the Daleks. Now, this is an episode, I would probably say Revolution of the Daleks is the Doctor Who episode that I have seen the least. Uh, not including classic series, of course. There are episodes I haven't seen. I think I've only seen Revolution of the Daleks twice. The plot is very forgettable to me. It reintroduces Jack Robertson. It's basically um, the Daleks are riot police. And at the end of the episode... Ryan and Graham leave. I love Graham as a companion. I think he is the best of the 13th Doctor's companions. I don't like the inclusion. I'm I, So, most Doctor Who fans love Jack Harkness. Um, most Doctor Who fans tend to love Mickey Smith. Uh, the problem with both characters is that their actors have turned out in recent years to be uh, revealed as very, very not great people. Uh, in in a formal sense, um, I won't go into any of the accusations, or I don't I, I don't think there have been any charges. Um, but Noel Clark and uh, John Berriman have had some things speculated in their direction, um, and I do my best to separate um, art from the artist. But this episode rubs me the wrong way. With that on top of it. But simply because of the fact that, that Jack Harkness' character doesn't need to be in this episode. For any reason. He, he didn't need to be in Series 12. He doesn't need to be in the Christmas special. They bring back Jack Robertson, uh, the, the Trump stand-in from Series 11. I gave my thoughts on Arachnids in the UK yesterday. They brought him back for some reason. People really didn't like him the first time. People didn't like him the second time. Um, this is where we get another one of those classic Chibnall location jumps where we're in London and now we're in Osaka, Japan, and now we're in space with the Doctor. It's very all over the place, very jumbled. It's a very good looking episode in my opinion. I think the Daleks look very good. Um, I think Chibnall handles the Daleks fairly well despite some of the lore issues. Um, Chibnall traditionally has done very well bringing back classic monsters. He does very well with the Cybermen. He does very well with the Daleks, and he does very well with the Santarans. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Revolution of the Daleks, I don't have a ton to say on it, but I think it sits firmly bottom of D tier. It's not bad enough for me to put in F tier, but it's very forgettable, and I'm putting it in D tier. Uh, let's move up then uh, to Spyfall Part 2. I love Spyfall Part 1. We'll talk about it when we get there. Spyfall Part 2 destroys everything that I love about Spyfall Part 1. It's got the Chibnall location and time jumping. All of a sudden, the Doctor is in a, a foreign dimension. And all of a sudden, the Doctor is in uh, 18, no, 1900s London. And, or 19th century London, excuse me. And then all of a sudden, the Doctor is in uh, France in the time of the Germans who the government was racist. Um, that word I'm not really supposed to say on YouTube. Um... Sasha Dewan is way too over the top in this episode. I like him better. So Sasha Dewan, my, my opinions on Sasha Dewan are weird, right? I think he's a very good actor. I think he is at his best when he is over the top. How do I how do I word this? I think he's at his best when he is over the top in a controlled sense. So what I mean by that is if the emotion of the scene calls for him to be emotional, that is where he's at his best. We'll talk about that more with Power of the Doctor tomorrow. I think, I think Sasha Dewan is fantastic in Power of the Doctor. In this episode, and we see it especially in, in the finale, um, Sasha Dewan is over the top in a cartoony way. And not even like classic master cartoony way. More like John Sim, but on steroids. And I already am not a huge fan of John Sim. I'm not a huge fan of some of the stuff that Michelle Gomez did with, with Missy as the master. Um, and then back on Earth, we have a less exciting half to the Daniel Barton um, Kasavin story. That part of it is very boring. The rest of it is very weird. I have heard... So there's, there's a, a, an account I follow on YouTube... Uh, it's DW Fan. What's the number? It's a he, major Doctor Who fan. Um, it's DW Fan ninety one, who defends the scene. Not defends, but but the scene where the Doctor basically turns the Master into the the Germans, 
let's say, um, and is sent to a forced labor camp, um, DWFan90... 91? Let me double check. I keep screwing up the number. 91. Um, is one of... Is a fan who who says that never happened. Like, like we imply that and that's not actually what happens. It is what happens. The doctor, in defense, technically, of herself and the two companions that she has with her, Ada Lovelace and Noor Iniat Khan, um, basically destroys the master's disguise to the point where the punishment for the master is going to be arrest for treason and then sent to a camp by the people who were famous for putting non-white people in camps. That is literally what happens here. The doctor does that, allows it to happen. That, to me, seems very out of character for the doctor. Not the 13th doctor. The 13th doctor was doing that stuff in series 11. We talked about that yesterday with Sim Shaw. The 13th doctor has a very weird connection with violence and vengeance. And to me, it is out of character with all of the other incarnations of the Doctor. Spyfall Part 2 is not good. Like I said, I love Part 1. We'll talk about Part 1 when we get there. I think Part 2, just like, everything falls apart. There's the reveal of Gallifrey being destroyed. Um, yeah. Acting, not great. World building, not great. Pacing, a little all over the place. I don't love Part 2. Let's go then to... Do we have any others in D tier? I don't believe so. Let's move up to C tier, and we're going to go bottom of C tier is Praxius. Praxius is an interesting episode. So I didn't watch Series 12 when it aired live. Um, this is after I had... This was just about when I had moved... No, I was still living at home, but we canceled our package that gave us BBC America. So I didn't have Doctor Who to watch live. My first impression of Doctor Who was through reviews from other YouTube creators, uh, Who Culture, or What Culture Doctor Who, Rich Hudson, that sort of channel. And because of my, my learning of the Doctor Who premises and plots and their opinions on things, um, this was the episode I was most excited to see. Mostly because it took place I think it came out either right before or right at the start of the pandemic. And so it was very kind of... The production schedule really worked out in Praxis's favor because it, it fits very well with what was going on in the world at the time. Um, I was excited about the location jumping. This is before I realized Chibnall had a, a huge problem with location jumping. I think this is a very good looking episode. I think the makeup is, is fairly good. I think the Praxis makeup looks decent. I think the plot is weird. Um, the plot, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. It's a little jumpy. Um, the stuff with the birds, I don't... I've never really understood. I've seen this episode at least six times. I've never understood the connection with the birds. Um, they use a lot of very quick side characters. They introduce a character very quick, and then they die off. And they kind of have to, because they want a threat, but they don't want the threat to impact our main characters. That has negative aspects to it. The um, the pop culture use of the the travel bloggers is is I think poorly written. I think they're very unlikable and not in a not in a self conscious way. Does that make any sense? So it, the script is not self aware enough, in my opinion, um, to use the travel bloggers' dislikability effectively. I think Suki is a weird villain. I think all of the stuff in Madagascar is portrayed really poorly. This is a better version of Orphan 55 to me, right? Orphan 55 told a very overhanded um, story about global warming and nuclear war, right? Like, don't do it. Be the difference. Praxius is very, a lot more subtle with its message of microplastic pollution. It's still very heavy-handed, but it's not hitting you over the top with it. They leave us room to imply, which is the best thing a writer can do. Leave space for the audience to think. Praxis still isn't that great of an episode. I don't think any of the side characters are very likable. I think the romance angle is really pushed. Um, whether whether it be a homosexual relationship or a heterosexual relationship, I think the, the romantic angle of this episode is very over-the-top, in-your-face, heavy-handed, poorly written. Um, the script doesn't support 
what we're supposed to believe as a complicated homosexual marriage, if that makes any sense from what I'm trying to say here. To me, Praxis is a C-tier episode. I'm leaving it there. Let's move up then to top of C-tier. I'm going to put Can You Hear Me? I actually really like Can You Hear Me? Um, it's this one here. I think the villains are fine. They're not great. They're not terrible. I think the premise of this episode is very good. Um, I like that Doc... <laughs> so you kind of have to juxtapose these next to each other. I really like that Doctor Who addressed the mental health stuff. I really do. It does it very well with Yaz. It does it fairly well with Thibaut. It doesn't do it very well with Graham. And that's where a lot of the criticism for this episode comes, is in the ending where Graham has the conversation with the doctor and the doctor doesn't know how to handle herself. That is a very poor direction for the script to take. The rest of the script, I think, is fairly strong. Like I said, the, the villains are kind of forgettable, but all of the stuff with Tahira, all of the stuff with Aleppo, all of the stuff with the 13th Doctor, um, apart from the Graham scene, and then, like I said, I think I think the Yaz stuff is fantastic. This is Yaz's best episode in all three seasons that she's in, including the specials. This is Yaz's best episode, in my opinion. I think Ryan gets a little more character development. It's mostly focused on his friend Thibaut. Um, but I think the mental health stuff, until the ending, is done very, very well. Apart from that, like I said, this episode does have issues. The villains aren't very strong. The threat is never seen as very strong. Um... And the pacing is a little weird. The editing of the different scenes doesn't mesh super well. And for me, those those quality issues aren't enough to push it to where I want it to be. When, when a script is hot, like when the story is hot, when the episode is hot, it's an A-tier episode. But there's too much production and writing stuff to just slightly bring this down um, all the way to me to C-tier. But very top of C-tier, in my honest opinion. Four more episodes to go. Um, I believe technically we're off to a better start than Series 11 was yesterday. Uh, let's move up to B tier. Oh, do I really have that in B tier? I think I have to. B tier, let's go with Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror. Let me double check that. That just doesn't seem right to me, but, but maybe I'll come back and rework these eventually. But let's go Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror. I think why I have it in B tier rather than A tier. Um, this is, this isn't the, the series' best episode by any means. Um, series 12 to me, and we'll talk about it more with Spyfall Part 1, Series 12 is where Doctor Who starts to feel like Doctor Who again, right? Um, a lot of people's criticism of the 13th Doctor era is that it doesn't feel like Doctor Who. Like, even the Capaldi era felt like Doctor Who, especially as we got more towards the end of his reign with Series 10. To me, this is where the Chris Chibnall, Jodie Whittaker era matches the classic feeling that I like with Doctor Who. And this, to me, Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, is a script that would make sense with any other Doctor. It's, it's strong. It's a strong script. Um, I think some of the acting is a little over the top. And what I, one criticism I have about this episode that I, that I wanted to make my opinions um, known about since I saw this for the very first time is I actually don't like the way that this episode portrays Nikola Tesla. Um, this episode treats Tesla like a hero. Very, very one note. As if Tes Tesla is always in the right. Tesla is a a genuinely like genius person great heart history tells us otherwise now keep in mind history may be tainted by someone like thomas edison but what we genuinely do know about nikola tesla is he was a weirdo nikola tesla was a weird guy he had a massive obsession with numerology he had a massive obsession with pigeons he by the end of his lifetime married a pigeon he, married, he may have married a cousin, too, but that's beside the point. Um, this episode treats Nikola Tesla as kind of a golden figure in technology, a can-do-no-wrong hero. That wasn't the case. I mentioned yesterday I loved the portrayal of King James because it was over the top and it was flamboyant, and that is exactly how history tells us that King James was. This 
the Nikola Tesla in this episode, despite the fantastic portrayal, um, I can't remember the actor's name. It's very, very Croatian. Um, he does a great job with the material he's given. Perfect job with the material he's given. The material that he's given, despite how much I love the script otherwise, does not portray Nikola Tesla in the correct way. It makes Thomas Edison into a bad guy, which is fairly historically accurate. Um, he's a very unlikable character, and I think the performance supports that. Um, I don't think the villains are very threatening, but this feels like a standard 10th Doctor single episode. It's It almost feels like a follow-up to something like The Runaway Bride, or even, oh gosh, which episode am I thinking of? Um, school Reunion where it's an adaptable species, if that makes any sense. Uh, and so the monsters kind of feel like they're taking advantage of Earth in the same way that the Krillitanes do in School Reunion. Other than my problems with Nikola Tesla, and other than my problems with a little bit of how forgettable the villains are and the ending, like I always forget the ending of this episode. I think this is a very good episode of Doctor Who. This is a very, like, this is a very standard classic, not classic Who, but, but classic, like, tenant era episode. I'm putting it in B tier. Let's move up then. Three more. Spyfall Part 1. Spyfall Part 1. Um, I mentioned just a few minutes ago that this is where Doctor Who, to me, feels like itself again. Spyfall Part 1 starts that off really strong. Spyfall Part 1, to me, feels like Doctor Who found a way to have fun again. Doctor Who, to me, wasn't really that fun since maybe Series 6, at least in the ways that I find fun with it. So, for five years, you get Doctor Who, and it's not a ton of fun. Spyfall feels that way to me. Spyfall brings back the whimsy of the, the Tenant era and the early Smith era. Um... It's a spy adventure, for the most part. Um, they're infiltrating and, and being detectives the way Doctor Who has always been. Um, the plot twist, in my opinion, is very good, despite my issues with the Sasha Duan Master in the second part. The first part is miles better than the second part. Um, I love the way that they use location jumping in this episode. It makes a lot of sense. It sets up a part two that could have been very good, and we didn't get that very good part two. I think um, Sasha Dewan's portrayal as O is very good. I think all of the companions have enough to do where they feel like themselves in an episode for the very first time. Um, there may be a couple instances of it back in Series 11, but really, this is a genuinely good start uh, to, like I said, my favorite Jodie Whittaker season. Um, a lot more balanced than Series 11 or even Series 13. Series 13 is a lot less material, though. Um, yeah, I love Spyfall Part 1. I, I don't love the portrayal of, of Daniel Barton, um, whoever that actor is. He was in Broadchurch, and I didn't really like him in Broadchurch that, that much either. Um, it feels like a role that was written for Idris Elba, and obviously he was either unavailable or too expensive for Doctor Who, so they found off-brand Idris Elba. Um, I think all of the location stuff, like I said, is very good. I think the, the location filming is very good. I think the set design is very good. The Kasabin are a very mysterious alien. It's a shame that we really don't get anything out of it in the second part. Um, but I think I think for a setup episode, for a first half of what could have been a very good two-parter, Spyfall Part 1 does everything right. To me, it's a top B-tier episode. Also in B-tier at the very top... Here's my controversial take. It's Fugitive of the Jadoon. Now, the one thing I... The one problem I have with Fugitive of the... The Fugitive of the Jadoon... Holy moly. The one issue that I myself have with Fugitive of the Jadoon... Hard title. Is that... It really doesn't feel like it has an ending. It feels like it doesn't have a plot for the second half, or maybe just the last third of the episode. Um, otherwise, the stakes of this episode are huge. Like, you feel this. The Jadoon were imposing in their first appearance with Smith and Jones. I feel the same way about them in this episode that I did back in Series 3. I think all of the stuff with uh, the Divi uh, is Do they talk about the Division in this episode? I can't remember. But, but the Time Lord Agency... Um, oh, gosh. What is the... I can't remember the the characters' names. I'm so sorry. I I do really like this episode, and, and I am spacing on the side characters' names. Um, 
There's some weird plot beats. Uh, the the guy who's like obsessed with Ruth at the beginning, trying to get her to break up with her husband, um, is a little weird. But like I said, the stakes are high. I think um, Joe Mart. I almost said Joe Grant. Joe Martin's um, portrayal as the Doctor is phenomenal. I think her acting throughout this episode in both roles is very, very good. My hair's probably standing up right now. I'm not looking at myself on camera. Sorry about that. Um, my, my train of thought is a little all over the place today, if that wasn't obvious. Maybe that's why I run a YouTube channel with so many different topics on it. Fugitive of the Jadoon. Um, the one thing I really don't like about this, apart from the ending of this episode, is the inclusion of Jack Harkness. It doesn't go anywhere. We talked a little bit about it in Revolution of the Daleks. Um, I don't like that they brought Jack back for they brought Jack back for just a simple um, cameo. I don't think it. I don't think it's warranted. It's a very fan servicey moment. I don't think it's warranted, especially the fact that he doesn't even see the Doctor. Um, the companions don't really have much to do in this episode, which is a shame. But I think all of the stuff with the the Doctor reveal is very cool. Had it been handled differently in the ending of the series or gone anywhere. This is an A-tier episode, genuinely. Like, all of this stuff, I, the, the tension I feel when Joe, uh, or when, uh, when Ruth breaks the glass and, like, takes in the Time Lord conscious, or, uh, whatever you want to call it, the Chameleon Sir Arc, Arch, Arc. Holy moly, I'm out of it today. Sorry, everybody. Um, I get the same feelings as I do at the end of Utopia, when the Master returns. I, like, genuinely, I love this episode's use of the Ruth Doctor. Um, her TARDIS is the best looking TARDIS ever, in my opinion. If I were to rank all of the TARDIS designs, and I would really like to eventually, if I were to rank all of the TARDIS interiors on a tier list, I'm pretty sure I would have the Fugitive Doctor TARDIS at the very top. I love its use of colors. I love the way it looks. I love its design. I love the Ruth Doctor. It's a shame it didn't go anywhere. Really, really is a shame. That's why it has to sit in B tier. Otherwise, I really love this episode. Uh, and then the very top. To me, it's not surprising. Maybe you have a different top episode, but um, I have this one all the way up in A tier. This is the best episode of the 13th Doctor's era. The Haunting of Villa Diodati. This is the first time where we have... the. the one of the very few episodes in the Chris Chibnall era where we have a very, very likable and fleshed out supporting cast. I mentioned in a previous video, I think it was a Series 9 video, where um, especially when we got into the, the 10th Doctor era, we, we had episodes where we knew everyone in the supporting cast. Series 4 does it very well. Um, Series 9, the reason we brought it up was Under the Lake Before the Flood has a very, very fleshed out supporting cast. Um, this episode is the best example of that in the Chibnall era, in the Jodie Whittaker era. Um, the Lone Cyberman is a very, very cool idea, very threatening villain, villain, very well portrayed in this episode. The only negative I have about this entire episode is the ending. I don't like the Doctor... It, it's this version of the Doctor is very much inconsistent with how the Doctor has been portrayed to f so the example I want to give is Fires of Pompeii, series 4, right? Where the Doctor can either save the world and sacrifice thousands of people or basically save thousands of people, but allow the entire future of the world to be at risk. In this episode, the 13th Doctor virtually does the opposite. Instead of allowing the lone Cybermen to kill one person and save the future of humanity, the Doctor threatens the future of humanity by saving one person. The Doctor has always been shown, despite the fact that the Doctor has always been shown to always try to save people except in thin ice but we talked about that in series 10 the doctor always tries to save people but the doctor will always make the choice to flip the switch on saving the many 
for the sake of sacrificing the few. She doesn't do that in this episode. That's the one thing I dislike about this episode to me that keeps it out of S tier. I think the, the supporting cast is fantastic. I think all of the companions have enough to do in this episode where they feel like fully fleshed out characters. Like I said, this has the best villain in the entire season. Um, potentially the best... Uh, I do like Sim Shaw, to be honest with you. But I think one of the best villains in the, the Chibnall era. Um, I think the, the whole concept of the house is very cool. Uh, the fact that the, the Siberium is basically shifting the way that they see the house so that they don't know where the doors are, they don't know where the stairs are. It's The haunting is call, caused by a perception filter. I think that's a very cool plot beat. Um, I like the chemistry between all of the different characters. I like the drama between the side characters. Uh, and I love, I love the ending between the side characters and their personalities. I do love that. The ending where they, they're doing the story time by the lake kind of thing. I love that. I do love that. Um, I don't love the ending with the Siberium and the Lone Cybermen. But otherwise, I think it's a fantastic episode. Easily the best of Series 12, in my opinion. And if you look at um, all of these episodes and kind of how they're balanced going up toward S tier, to me, that's why Series 12... 12 is better than series 11. Um, to me, it has, like I said earlier in this video, much higher highs, still much lower lows, but all in all, I like it a lot more. I would much rather go back and watch series 12 because I know there are points that I'm going to very much like, whereas with series 11, I tend to be a lot more bored. There's not a single episode in series 11 that I would like genuinely want to go back to on a consistent basis. Whereas here, there's plenty. I would watch Haunting of Villa Diodati all day. Like, back to back to back to back. Fugitive, Fugitive of the Jadoon. Um, I would go back and watch. Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, I'd go back and watch. Basically, everything about... Eh, Prax Praxis, maybe not, but C tier and higher here. Um, like, I would genuinely go back and watch those on a whim. I Those episodes excite me. They do, they do something for me that I like with Doctor Who. Uh, and that's what I like about Series 12, is it kind of brings me back to that classic Doctor Who era. It's, it's, it's far from... Doctor Who perfection, but it's back on track, in my opinion, until, of course, we get to some of these latter episodes. Let me know what you thought in the comments section below. Of course, by the time you're seeing this, you've probably seen all three of the 60th anniversary specials. Let me know what you think of those episodes in the comments below and where you think they should end up in my eventual ranking of the 60th anniversary specials. Like, share, subscribe. There will be links to other Doctor Who videos, including an entire two-hour-long timeline talking about the Doctor Who chronological order of things on the channel. Link on the bottom left hand of your screen. Channels above me. In the meantime, see you very very soon.